So, by looking at galaxies and their mass, we come to an extraordinary conclusion. There seems to be an awful lot more mass, especially in the outskirts of galaxies, than we can see. Now, whenever we have an extraordinary conclusion, we really look, need to look for extraordinary evidence. We've got one piece of evidence, but that's probably not really enough here. We need some more evidence. So let's go through and use something that Einstein predicts for massive things in the universe, which is gravitational lensing. So when Einstein proposed his theory of general relativity, one of the things it predicted was that space would be bent by gravity. And so this is the way that uh, Eddington first showed that general relativity seemed to be realized in nature, was looking at how the sun bent the light of background stars during an eclipse. So let's do this for a galaxy. If we look around, I bet you we can find galaxies behind other galaxies, or objects behind other galaxies. And we should be able to occasionally get to a place where the galaxy will bend space enough where we'll literally see light from a background object come to us in two ways. If we can find one of those things, we should be able to weigh the galaxy directly from Einstein's field equations. And here's a particularly spectacular example of a gravitational lens. Here we have a cluster of galaxies that's about three billion light years away. But you see this blue squiggle, blue squiggle, blue squiggle? These are all different images of the same background galaxy, maybe about 10 billion light years away. The light's been bent around the bottom and the top and the side of the cluster, giving us multiple different images of the same thing. And that allows us to weigh this cluster. And once again, the weight of the cluster comes out much higher than that amount we could calculate using light from all the stars in it. There's another approach we can use, which is to look at the gas in clusters of galaxies. As you remember from the formation of the first objects, we have a cluster of galaxies, gas is going to be constantly falling into it. As the gas falls in, that means there's going to be more and more gas in the middle. Some of it turns into stars, most of it doesn't. The gas is going to get more and more compressed, hotter and hotter, until eventually it will start glowing at X-ray wavelengths. Ooh. So that's what this cluster looks like in X-rays. So literally 10 million degree gas. Now, if this gas is not in equilibrium, uh, the pressure of this gas will cause this whole thing to blow up as sort of a giant ball. Now, we know that that doesn't appear to be happening. So the pressure of this gas must be in equilibrium with gravity. So all we have to do is take the temperature and the amount of pressure, which we measure from the X-ray image, and balance it against how much gravity would be needed, and we could weigh the cluster that way. And it turns out that this method gives about the same answer as gravitational lensing or by looking at the motions of the objects. In fact, in this cluster you can see there's a gravitational lens there as well. And in all cases it's giving a very consistent answer. There is a lot more mass in these things than we can see. A very great deal more. And it's not at the same place. If we look at where the normal matter is, the density of normal matter is highest, say, in the middle of a galaxy or a cluster, and then drops off fairly quickly as you go away. But this extra mass that we can't see is more spread out. There, it does peak in the middle, but doesn't peak as sharply. It becomes dominant when you go out in the outskirts of galaxies. And this is a scenario that we see pretty much everywhere we can look in the universe. So let's not be too hasty here, Brian. I mean, we've said, start talking about dark matter and where it's located, but we haven't actually seen dark matter. All we've seen is gravitational forces, and the gravitational forces, all our evidence is these gravitational forces are too strong in the outskirts of galaxies. So when we go through and we measure things by gravity, we're using Newton's law of gravity, the one over r squared law, which is what general relativity turns into at large distances. Perhaps we could modify it a little bit. Yes, so this is a theory called MON for Modified Newtonian Dynamics. Instead of force equals GMM over R squared, we have GMM over R squared plus a bit. What's this bit? Well, you want it to be pretty small. What that means is because it's pretty small, when you're close into a galaxy or a solar system or the Earth, this will be much bigger than that, so you can ignore that. It's only when you go far, far out, where gravity is very weak, a long way out from any stars or galaxies in the outskirts of a cluster or a galaxy, exactly the places where we see evidence for dark matter, R gets very, very big, this whole term becomes very, very small, and this starts to dominate. So, so how well does this work if we try it out as our fudge factor 
for the Milky Way and other galaxies. It actually works ridiculously well. People have been trying to kill it from that for a long time. You just need one parameter you need to fit. You can fit it on any one galaxy, and then you can apply it everywhere, and it works extremely well. Uh, it's very clear that even if there is dark matter, it must behave in a way that mimics this. It gives you the flat rotation curves, gives you the right size for so every galaxy that's ever been measured, and that's thousands of galaxies. So perhaps we should have another look at dark matter and maybe look at a place where we can see it more directly and not using this law. Yeah, so if you want to try and kill this, this works so well in galaxies, maybe it doesn't work so well in other places like clusters. What we'd really want is a situation where, I mean, this theory says there is no dark matter. It's already normal matter plus extra gravity. Maybe there's a situation where you could expect the normal matter and the dark matter to be in different places, then this theory and the dark matter theory would give different answers. And luckily there is such a place, it's called the bullet cluster. What we have here is two galaxy clusters which have passed through each other. As they went through, all the gas, which is actually where most of the normal matter is, has been left in the middle. But if they are made of dark matter, the dark matter should still be over here and here. So let's explain what this, this image is. The reddish color stuff in the center, well, that's the places where things are glowing in X-rays. And X-rays are caused, as recalled, by atoms being very hot and crashing into each other. And the bluish tinge is where the mass has been measured by gravitational lensing. So it doesn't care if it's atoms or whatever. And so we can go through and we can see that the X-rays, the place where the atoms are, not exactly the same place where the mass is measured through this gravitational lensing. Yes, when the two clusters went through each other, the dark matter should have stayed with the galaxies. And so the dark matter theory predicts that there should be mass here and here, which is indeed what you see from the bluish light. However, most of the normal matter is in the middle, so if Bond was correct and it was just normal matter that's producing this extra force, the gravitational lensing should all be around here. Right, so it's like that the mass, the gravitational mass, really is composed of two things. One thing that likes to collide with each other, atoms, and another thing that likes to go right through itself, dark matter. So most people would say this is pretty good evidence that the Bond theory is wrong, and there actually is huge amounts of mysterious stuff. I have a number of friends who disagree with that and say it's actually not quite as clear as that. Um, part of the trouble is that Bond is not very well developed mathematically, and so it's actually a little hard to predict exactly what should happen in the situation from Bond. But I think we should bear in mind so much of what we do in astrophysics is extrapolating the laws of physics. So we've taken Newton's law of gravity, which is very well tested in our own solar system with space probes and planets, and extrapolated it out from a scale of 10 to the 12 metres to 10 to the 22, 20 to 23 metres. So we're extrapolating it out by 10 orders of magnitude. And just have to be very careful about doing that. You're sure maybe the laws of physics that work in our solar system still work 100 billion times bigger. But there have been plenty of counterexamples in the past. For example, Newton's laws of motion, developed by Isaac Newton, work perfectly well for things weighing a few kilograms, travelling at a few metres per second, like me on a bike. So people back in the 19th century assumed it would apply everywhere. Then it was discovered that, in fact, if you extrapolate down to scales of nine, eight or nine orders of magnitude smaller, it doesn't work anymore. You need new theory, quantum mechanics. If you scale up in velocity by seven orders of magnitude, it also doesn't work. You need relativity. So maybe there are going to be new laws of physics on really big scales or really strong gravities or the other situations that we see in space but don't see on Earth. It's worth keeping that in mind. But the key is going to be testing them. And so these types of tests are important, but we need to keep on looking for additional tests of whether or not general relativity and the idea of dark matter is correct or whether or not we need to modify general relativity.